unexplained lights in the skies, haunting screams in abandoned asylums, people disappearing into thin air, whispers of encounters that chill you to the bone. Are they just myths, or is there something more? I'm Austin, and these are the Spook Files. National parks, America's crown jewels, vast wilderness, places of natural beauty, but also of danger. Every year, people vanish without a trace. Some cases are solved. Others remain forever shrouded in mystery. This is the world of the missing 411. The missing 411 is a term coined by former police officer David Pilates, who has researched and published several books about people who go missing in North America. These are not normal disappearances, however. These are disappearances where something is off, where the facts just don't add up. Now, among these missing 411 cases, there are some common characteristics that are shared between a lot of the cases. Some of the characteristics of these disappearances are disappearances in national parks or other wilderness areas, victims found in unexpected locations, victims found miles away from where they went missing, victims found dead only a few hundred feet away from civilization, people found alive with no memory of how they got there, or stories that just don't make sense. Strange weather patterns connected with the disappearance, missing article of clothing, especially shoes, and victims often being found near bodies of water. Understandably, the missing 411 has sparked intense debate. Skeptics argue that these disappearances are tragic, but not unusual. People get lost, accidents do happen, and sometimes, unfortunately, bodies are never recovered. The profile points they say are simply coincidences. However, there are the cases that defy easy dismissal. Children vanishing within minutes, never found despite extensive searches. Victims found in areas previously combed by rescuers. Strange injuries and inexplicable causes of death. Some believe there is something more at play. Whether that is cryptids, hidden predators, or even government conspiracies. In 2023, Martin Resney took statistical data from 1,127 missing 411 cases and began to study them. His analysis is most likely the first of its kind and provided us with the following information about missing 411 cases. Men account for over 75% of the disappearances significantly higher than the roughly 50-50 gender split in the general population. Children and adolescents vanish at twice the expected rate based on census data. However, at the same time, minors are found alive far more often than adults. Young men, 18 through 24, are found dead much more frequently than other adult groups. The elderly do have the highest rates of remaining unfound. And while weather did affect 33% of search and rescue operations, the results were typically the same as the ones that weren't affected at all. 
Every missing 411 case tells a different chilling story. That's why I'm committed to taking a deep dive into individual cases on future episodes of The Spook Files. We'll unravel the strange details, the unanswered questions, the mysteries that linger to this day. Want to help shape the investigation? Hit subscribe and comment below. Tell me which missing 411 case haunts you the most, the one that you want me to explore. I know personally the case of Garrett Beardsley is the most haunting one to me. Nearly two decades ago, Garrett went missing near his campsite and vanished without a trace. Today, we will delve into one of the most perplexing missing person cases I have ever heard. This case in particular haunts me as during the time it happened, I was a Cub Scout and somehow never heard this story until I was fully grown, despite its direct connections to the Boy Scouts of America. In August of 2004, Garrett Bardsley, his father Kevin, and his scout troop headed to the Uinta Mountains in Utah for one last camp out before school started. Garrett and his father decided to go fishing at one of the lakes near the campsite. As there were multiple lakes near the campsite, there is some disagreement between different storytellers of exactly which lake they were fishing at. It doesn't help matters that these lakes weren't really named and instead were identified by different numbers. But they do all agree that no matter which lake they were at, they would have only been 400 to 500 feet away from the campsite where the rest of the scouts were. There were also established paths in the area leading between the various lakes and the campsites. Now, while fishing, Garrett had gotten his shoes and socks wet and wanted to go back to the campsite to change into dry clothes. He then said he would return to fish with his dad. Given how close the campsite was, his father allowed Garrett to walk back by himself. He figured with the established trails and the fact that he could see Garrett for around half of the walk, that he would be safe. Now, I do have to point out that this breaks one of the core tenets of the Boy Scouts, which is always to use the buddy system. It does not matter how close or how far you are going. If you are going out of the sight of others, you are supposed to have a buddy. Kevin watched as Garrett walked towards the campsite, fishing pole in hand. He reportedly even yelled out directions to the campsite, corrected his son when his son almost took a wrong path, and reminded his son to stay on the established trails. By the time Garrett was out of sight, he should have been less than 300 feet from the campsite. After 15 to 20 minutes, though, Kevin began to feel uneasy. It shouldn't have taken Garrett that long to change his clothes and come back. Kevin decided to return to the campsite to find Garrett. Unfortunately, upon arriving at the campsite, he learned that his son had never made it back. A search was launched immediately starting with the adults of the troop, then the scouts, then the police, and then volunteers from the area. Over 200 volunteers helped search that area, and that number would eventually grow to roughly 500 searchers combing through a four square mile area around where Garrett was last seen. Unfortunately, during this time, there were no signs of him. No signs of a struggle, 
none of his personal items, no DNA, nothing at all. The only possible break in the case was when a Nike sock was found in a boulder field about a half mile from the place Garrett was last seen alive. Heidi, Garrett's mother, believed that this sock was Garrett's, and it did match what he was last seen wearing. But, unfortunately, a member of the search and rescue team had reported that he lost a sock that also matched the description after changing his socks during the search. To this day, it is considered that this sock was the search and rescue member. However, there is no proof either way of who the sock belonged to. Scent dogs were brought in, but they were unable to pick up a scent. The search, tragically, was eventually turned into a rescue mission, and then was called off due to nothing being found. Kevin kept searching, however, still having hope his son was out there. Unfortunately, to this day, no trace of Garrett has surfaced. Before we get into the theories about his disappearance, I want to discuss some silver linings that came out of this tragic event. Roughly a year later, another young boy went missing in the same area. Due to the experience they had with searching for Garrett, the boy was thankfully found alive. Kevin actually drove up to the Uinta Mountains to join the search party to help find the boy and to help reassure the family. The family also started a non-profit focused on helping search and rescue teams find missing children. Now that we know the tragic story, let's dive into the theories and possible explanations for Garrett's disappearance. Some believe that Garrett's death was a simple case of an animal attack, such as a bear or mountain lion. While this is certainly possible, there is no evidence. There were no signs of a struggle, no blood, no DNA in the area. And that is something that you would expect if Garrett was indeed attacked and killed by a wild animal. Others believe that he may have been abducted. Now, this is a possibility I do not want to rule out, but does raise its own questions. The lakes were quite a hike away from any nearby roads, so why would a kidnapper be somewhere they can't make a quick getaway? Why would the abductor take the fishing pole with them? Or how did they get rid of it in a way that it still hasn't been found to this day? There's also the question of why Garrett didn't put up a fight or why he didn't scream if he was abducted. To me, it only makes sense for him to be abducted if it was someone he knew. Although, it is highly unlikely. What if someone he knew and trusted intercepted him before he made it to the campsite and was able to lead him off the mountain? Of course, trying to theorize this way just leads to more questions than answers, such as who would do this, why would they do this, why would they choose this exact time, and how did they know that Garrett would end up alone. Now finally, the last of the normal theories is that he simply got lost or wandered off. A lot of people love to dismiss this because of how easy it was to get to the campsite and based off the fact that Garrett was a Boy Scout and did have survival training. While it's true that it should have been an easy walk to the campsite from where he was last seen, it is still possible he did end up taking the wrong trail once he was out of sight. Kevin also reported that he had to correct Garrett on the right trail back to the campsite, which I think makes this theory more likely. 
As for the wilderness survival training, I will admit this would give him an edge over most other kids. However, it is important to remember at the end of the day, he was still a 12 year old boy. I will also interject that I was around 12 or 13 when I did my wilderness survival badge with the scouts. And while I did learn a lot, I do not rationally think that young me would have been able to survive an extended amount of time with what we learned. There is also the matter of the search area. While four square miles is by no measure a small area, many of the missing 411 cases result in people being found miles away from their location. It is also reasonable to believe that if Garrett did end up lost, he got panicked and continued down the trails, well out of that four square mile range. Of course, with simple explanations often turned away, many people have turned to paranormal explanations. Now, let's begin with a detail that I am including in the paranormal section because I've only ever seen it referenced in one place with no other proof. According to this source, as Kevin was walking back to the camp, he did hear the disembodied voice of Garrett say, Dad, but ignored it. While this detail can add to the spook factor of the case, I do not see a world where a father worried about his kid and actively going to look for his kid ignores the sound of his child's voice. It just does not make sense to me. Now, there is also the boulder field where the Nike sock was found. Boulder fields are very popular in missing 411 cases and can represent a myriad of different things. There are the far more reasonable explanations such as hidden crevices or underground tunnels in and around boulder fields, but there is of course the paranormal. According to some, boulder fields can be portals to alternate dimensions. Now, if you will excuse a bit of a tangent, I would like to point out in some light research, I learned that some boulder fields can be 10 to 12 feet deep. While not a supernatural explanation, part of me wonders if Garrett did in fact find the boulder field and if for whatever reason, part of the field collapsed in under Garrett's feet, swallowing him and unfortunately burying him under the boulders. This would be tragic, but it would also explain why nothing from Garrett was ever found. Now, I will fully admit that I am unsure how deep that specific boulder field is and have been unable to find data on it. This is simply a small theory that I came up with based off minimal research. Now moving back into the supernatural, the last supernatural theory that we are going to cover involves skinwalkers. The area in Utah where Garrett went missing is close to the infamous Skinwalker Ranch. Skinwalkers are a creature from Navajo folklore they can shape shift most often into animals, but sometimes can copy human faces they have seen before. I've also heard reports that this area is on what people call the path of the skinwalker, but unfortunately I was unable to find really any information on exactly what that is. Some people believe that a skinwalker could have killed Garrett or taken the face of someone he knew and led him away. Unfortunately, there is one last theory. This is a theory that I hesitate to mention as I do not personally believe it and feel it is disrespectful to the family. However, 
I have seen it discussed on quite a few threads online and feel that it would be unfair to not present all angles. This final theory, this darkest theory, theorizes that whether it was on purpose or by accident, Kevin was responsible for Garrett's death and disposed of his son's body. People who believe this theory point out that his dad was the last one to ever see him and possibly the only one to see him that morning. All of our details about Garrett's disappearance come from Kevin. They also point out that his story was very detailed involving Garrett's disappearance. And it is true that in some cases, a suspect will give an extremely detailed story to seem more convincing. Another thing they point to was that if Garrett did plan on coming back right after changing, why did he take his fishing pole with him? Now, I will admit, I do agree the act of taking his fishing pole is very odd, especially since he was supposed to be coming right back. But I do find no reason to believe that Kevin could be responsible for Garrett's disappearance. And I feel that this theory is overall disrespectful to the family. Still, I would feel remiss if I didn't present all angles. And from just a logical standpoint, this theory is more likely than alternate dimensions or skinwalkers. But again, I would like to reiterate, I do not believe this theory, and I do believe that it is disrespectful to the family. To this day, no remains or trace of Garrett have been found. Garrett has, of course, unfortunately been declared dead, and although no body or remains were ever found, the official cause of death was considered exposure. In talks given since, Kevin has said he believes that Garrett did unfortunately die in the wilderness. He speculates that the reason no remains were found is because Garrett built a survival shelter so well and so hidden that the search and rescue teams were unable to find it. That is the tragic and unsolved disappearance of Garrett Bardsley, the missing 411 case that haunts me the most. Hopefully one day we will get answers onto what happened to Garrett even if it is just his remains being found in the Uinta Mountains. On the Spook Files, we explore the unexplained, the conspiracies that keep you up at night, the disappearances that defy logic. After the heartbreaking story of Garrett Bardsley, we turn to a missing 411 case with a twist. The victim was found alive. But the strange tale of Stephen Rowan Griffin raises more questions than answers. Picture this, October 2010, New Hampshire. Two-year-old Stephen Rowan Griffin, who goes by the name Rowan, full of life, plays with other children at his grandmother's rural home, then vanishes. Nowhere to be seen. The last sight of him chasing a cat around the property. But no one knows where he is. His frantic family searches. But when they are unable to find him, they call the authorities. And the search intensifies. Police and game wardens flock to the scene to begin an investigation. Many volunteers attempt to help out as well but most are turned away. Day turns into night, and temperatures drop below freezing. Time was not on their side when it came to the search for the young toddler. Finally, 
at 1.40 a.m. A single heartbreaking clue. A tiny shoe. While many may see this as a horrific sign that something could have happened to young Rowan, determined family friends saw this as a sign of hope and continued the search, venturing where others hadn't. 20 minutes later, three miles away from where he was last seen, a faint sound pierces the darkness, a tiny cry. They call out Rowan's name, and a small voice cries back, asking for his mom. Deep within a swamp, rescuers find Rowan, terrified, shaking, his lips blue, but miraculously alive and otherwise well. He clings to a tree in the swamp waters, waters that would have easily drowned him. Reunited with his family, happiness, safety, and warmth returns, but the mystery still lingers. How did a toddler traverse three miles of harsh wilderness into the middle of a swamp? How was he found clinging to a tree, surrounded by waters that would have been over his head had he tried to walk in them? And how was he reportedly found bone dry? There is also the presence of the missing clothing, a hallmark of missing 411 cases. While a toddler missing a shoe is by no means a special occurrence, Rowan's sweatshirt was also missing, and when asked about it, he was unable to provide many details, but was able to say that his sweatshirt ended up high in the trees. One would wonder how this sweatshirt could end up high in the trees when a toddler is the one who is wearing it. Unfortunately, we may never know. The sweatshirt was never found. But of course, I do have to imagine, once Rowan was home safe, his family really didn't care about that sweatshirt. Finally, there is one detail, one piece of the puzzle, that makes sense to no one involved, and, in my opinion, also provides a bit of levity to the case. Apparently, when asked why he wandered so far from home, he said it was because the cow scared him. Now, this statement is weird, given that there were no cows anywhere near this location, and this swampy, wooded landscape would not be a location where cows would roam. Now, I have to admit, I find this detail very funny for some reason. And thankfully, since Rowan was found safe, I do think it is fine to find some levity in this part of the story. Still, it is undetermined what Rowan meant by this. Most agree he probably misidentified an animal as a cow or saw an animal he did not know the word for, but looked closest to a cow. But the question remains, what animal would look like a cow in the swampy woods of New Hampshire? While Warwin's safe return offers relief, the circumstances of his disappearance align unsettlingly with the hallmarks of missing 411 cases. Could something unexplainable have been at play that night? Or can this strange tale be pieced together as just a toddler wandering away from his family? The mystery of Rowan Griffin's disappearance and survival remains. Today, Rowan would be around 16 years old and most likely has very little or no memory of his strange disappearance. But what do you think happened in those New Hampshire woods? 
let me know in the comments down below. And remember, sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. The world is a strange and mysterious place. What we encounter tonight serves as a reminder. There's more to this reality than we understand. Keep your eyes open, question the shadows, and remember, the truth may be closer than you think. Until next time, stay curious, stay spooky, and good night.